Lecture 4, The Seed and the Promises to Abraham. So in our previous lectures, we've already accumulated several important ideas to understand about biblical theology. We started out with a definition of biblical theology, and we learned that biblical theology explores the big picture story of scripture, told through time, the progression of ideas as the story of scripture unfolds. That led us to a theological lens for thinking about scripture, that as we read, we see creation, fall, redemption, restoration, as a grid for understanding the entire story. But that led us further to a specifically chronological framework, the Old Testament eras, patriarchs, the exodus, judges, the exile, and the return. One concept that I want to add to this chronological framework is to recognize that there is a, a kind of narrative arc in the hope that are hopes that are raised throughout these periods, starting off with the creation and the patriarchs. This is very hopeful because after man's sin, you see the, the promise of the seed who will deliver. And together with that, the promises to Abraham, a seed who will be a blessing to the world, our hopes rise. And when we come to Exodus, then our hopes rise even further. God delivers the nation from bondage. God makes them a nation of his own. He brings them into the promised land. They receive it and they even conquer the promised land. But here the arc turns, right at the moment when we think things are going to turn out rather well. Judges and the kings come, and the people turn away from God. They rebel. The, the pattern of judges and the kings is a long spiral downward until things get so nasty that God tells the people over and over, he will judge them with a foreign nation. They will be carried off into bondage again, almost a return to Egypt. And it happens the exile. It's at that moment that one could feel a sense of despair. Has God forgotten his people? Is there no hope? Is this the end? And that's the last part of the arc. At the very end of the story, there's a slight turn upwards. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, God has not given up on his people. There is hope still. Following that narrative arc then, growing through the patriarchs, Exodus and Joshua, crashing through the judges and the kings, and reaching the bottom at the exile, but then the hope returning in the final books of scripture of the Old Testament, gives us an appreciation of the richness of the biblical story and how it leads us to anticipate the coming of the Messiah. But more on that later. For now, we are focusing this time on creation, Abraham, and the patriarchs. And if we're going to talk about the book of Genesis, we need to recognize several major events that define the book. And then we need to ask what the theological role of each one of those events is. First, the events themselves. Genesis starts off, of course, with the creation and fall. We've talked about that already, but there's something we ought to return to here. And it is the messianic hope. Genesis 3.15 sets a powerful trajectory for the rest of the book and the rest of scripture. The flood, however, gives us a sense or a window into judgment. Things are getting bad and mankind has to be dealt with for sin. Likewise, Babel, what's wrong with humanity? And why are people so broken? But that ends as we proceed further in the book with some hope again, the Abrahamic covenant and the promises of God. Now we ought to understand the role of each one of these and each one of these events raises its own kind of question. We ought to know what does each event in the story mean, not just what happened, but what is the theology behind it? What is the purpose and what does it teach us in the framework of all of scripture? For instance, why the flood? Why Babel? What's happening in these events? What did God promise to Abraham? And how was Abraham saved? If Abraham was trusting in Jesus, which is the only way that salvation comes, how was that even possible? How could Abraham know anything about the coming Messiah? But on our way, but on our way there, we ought to start with the fundamental promise that opens the book of Genesis. So God has blessed mankind. He's made a good world. Mankind is turned away, betraying God. And as a result, then bringing sin and death upon all of planet Earth and certainly upon himself. That's, of course, followed by the curse. 
But as you remember, there is a statement of hope mixed in to the middle of the curse, and it warrants our close attention. Let's notice first the contrast between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. The contrast goes between you and the woman, but between also your offspring and her offspring. And if that is followed out, then her offspring, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. So that fundamental contrast between the serpent and his seed and the offspring of the woman, her seed, that contrast defines the entire verse. Notice what the conflict looks like. It's described here as enmity. It's described further as bruising and destroying, hurting, harming. And so what we've got here is a struggle between the two sides, the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, a struggle that is at the nature of enmity at the level of actually a life and death struggle. This is not just a little disagreement or misunderstanding. This is a, a fight for survival. And down to the point then that there is a final interesting contrast, he will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. Both will suffer through this conflict. But it's not a symmetrical suffering. The conflict goes one way, very distinctively. In other words, there is a victor for this conflict. One side wins, and it's the side of the seed of the woman. As we proceed outward then from this verse and its promise, we're waiting for that seed to come. Who is the seed of the woman? I mean, offspring could refer to many, or it could refer just to one. And so is it referring to all humans as descendants of the woman, after all? One would think that the, on the simplest reading of this, that the, it's the humans against the snakes or something like that. But then you begin to watch the humans. And the defining question of the rest of Genesis now becomes, who is the seed of the serpent? As you watch the humans, are they acting more like the seed of the woman, or are they acting more like the seed of the serpent? Which one is it? Which one will it be? Almost immediately after this promise is given to us, we read that Adam and Eve fulfill what God told them. They begin to multiply and fill the earth. And so as humans are born to them, then we're looking at each one of these humans and we're wondering what their nature is. As you watch then multiplication of many generations and all down through the book of Genesis, you receive your answer. It's only the next chapter in Genesis 4 that one brother murders the other brother out of jealousy. And in that same chapter that we find immorality, a man with multiple wives who prides himself for his murderous behavior. And following that, the next chapter, we read a genealogy recording for us that humans are becoming many and filling the earth just as God said they would. But in fact, if I'm looking at this and asking what is their nature, the nature of almost the entirety is that they're behaving more like the serpent than what God would intend, the dignity that he gave to mankind in the beginning. Readers come to gen genealogies like Genesis 5, and they're immediately turned off because they find it entirely uninteresting. They have to recognize, rather, that there's an important role in each one of these genealogies. It's showing you the increase of mankind, and it's showing you also the pattern that the seed of the serpent characterizes humanity more than the dignity that God gave. You do see some exceptions. For instance, the man that Cain killed, Abel, is a man who had a heart, apparently, to serve God. He suffered and died for it. You also read about Seth, and so here's another individual, or Enoch, or much later, Noah, and so you find mixed within all of those about that are showing the desperation, the corruption, the nastiness of sin, you find mixed throughout a few that have a heart and a desire to know God and follow him. But the overall pattern, the predominant pattern, is of rebellion and betrayal. 
So has the seed of the serpent overcome? Has the seed of the serpent destroyed God's purposes for mankind? That brings us to the next major event in the book of Genesis, and it's the story of the flood. If we're asking whether the seed of the serpent is prevailing, whether God's purposes have been set aside, you could almost start to wonder that based on patterns like this. In Genesis 6, we read that God saw that the wickedness of man was very great and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is not encouraging for the status of mankind. The Genesis record goes on. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him at his heart. It's not that God changed his mind or that God did not foresee or know what would happen. But it is the reality in an authentic way that God was deeply saddened by all the horror that is brought about by sin. Chapter 6, verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God. It was filled with violence. It was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. The world has come to the point where it's going to need to be destroyed. The earth is filled with violence throughout. And therefore, God declares his intention to bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Everything that is in the earth shall die. One pause, or pause for one quick comment here to note that it is mankind's sin that defines the reality and that has brought about all of this horror. But the implications of that stretch beyond just mankind so that even the animals will be affected by the horror that has become our status. God's intentions in the flood then are to deal with the nastiness of sin and to do it by more or less wiping clean the earth. So here's the framework that you should think of when you think of the flood. As a result of how horrifying sin has become, God's intentions in the flood are to wash everything clean and to give it kind of a new start. Think of the flood like a return back to Genesis 1. If possibly we could clean everything off and start over again with a righteous man and his family. And maybe the problem is all of the culture and the institutions, it's the pattern, it's, it's the impression and the example that one human is given to another human. Things have gotten off to a bad start as you read along. Perhaps then maybe if we can get a fresh start, a righteous man at the beginning, and a clean beginning to the entire earth. Let's go back to Genesis 1 and maybe this will be our answer. The flood shows you that even if you had an opportunity like that, Mankind is still inexorably, unchangeably, irresolvably broken. It's going to take more than that. It's going to take a miracle. Let me start first by showing you then the parallels between the flood, the story and the account of what God sent, and the beginning, how actually the flood echoes the original creation account. We're looking on one side, the creation account, Genesis 1 and 2. On the other, the flood account, Genesis 9 through 11. And some of the powder patterns are fairly incidental. For instance, the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters, and in a parallel way, a wind blows over the earth, the waters subside. Some of the parallels are much stronger, however. For instance, God gave up blessing to every beast of the earth, to all the living creatures. And you have this pattern of the birds of the heavens, those that creep on the earth, and to all of them they're given the blessing to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the waters and the seas, to multiply upon the earth. And parallel to that, in the Genesis, or in the flood account, every living thing that is with you, birds, animals, every creeping theme, are to come out and to be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Moving downward in the pattern, God blesses them, and God says to mankind, and also by extension to the rest of creation, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, for mankind have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And that's paralleled in the, the flood account, God blessing Noah and his sons, telling them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And here, now, that same dominion mandate though uh, turn a bit in a new direction, the fear of you, the dread of you, will be upon all of these creatures. And the fear, because now the result of sin, there is a changed relationship to the creation. 
Notice that the end of this account is returning and giving Noah permission his sons as far as what they can eat. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As you, I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. That is a progression on the Genesis account where God granted every plant and every, every uh, seed and plant and tree with its fruit that those things would be for food. So very strong parallels across. Yet another parallel, God created man in his own image, in the image of God he made them, and God blessed them and told them to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth. Parallel to that, you have a restatement of the image of God. God made man in his own image, own image, so you be fruitful, multiply, increase, and fill the earth. Now those patterns are very strong, but there's a bit more. In each one of these cases, there's kind of a, a hopeful sense, the sense that maybe are we returning back to Eden? And does that mean then that we might have a fresh beginning with a righteous man who will do it right this time? Maybe then this is going to be the answer to the problem of the curse, even as one of Noah's ancestors said, is he the one who will finally give us rest from the curse? Is this then kind of a new beginning or another Adam type? And what you discover is if you're going to extend that out and wash the earth clean and get a new start, if these are echoes of Eden, all of the echoes are actually present. Because just like Adam, Noah also sins. Just like Adam, the curse also falls. And just as with Adam then, the story turns back again in a very pessimistic direction. You've encountered probably this story. Noah, after coming from the ark, then goes and he plants a vineyard and he takes some of the fruit and he gets drunk. The result of his drunkenness, he's lying naked in his tent and his children come and apparently in some kind of mocking way, dishonoring their father, there's something that goes on. We're not entirely sure of the details of it, but enough to say that there's definitely dishonoring. The family relationship is broken. And the result of this is that Noah turns and he utters a curse, a curse against his own children. Now, again, let's highlight and recognize some of the patterns inherent to that. In Genesis, the man and his wife were both naked, but there was no shame. In contrast here in Genesis 9, when now Noah is drunk, there's the nakedness of his father, it's seen by others, and it's a very shameful thing. The result of that is a curse. God warns that the ground is cursed, and because of this, then in pain you will eat of it. Similarly, in the end of the flood, God then gives a promise, I will never again curse the ground because of man. But recognizing that there's evil in the heart of man from his youth, what we discover is that the curse is already here. The curse that was given originally to Adam and Eve and the serpent now is paralleled by a curse from the mouth of Noah. Cursed be Cain, Canaan. And the result of that is that we see that curse is still with us. The mess and the chaos and the disorder is still here. Now, even mixed together with the curse, just as before, there is blessing. So we recognize even here some pointer to Shem. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And something pointing to the future, highlighting even where the blessing will come from. As we continue on and we understand the genealogy of Abraham, we come to appreciate even more the richness of that blessing. But the role of the flood, in short, is to demonstrate to us that even if you began again, the problem of humanity is deeper. The problem of humanity is in human hearts, and that problem demands a solution. What about the Tower of Babel? So this is, of course, a very interesting account that just draws our imagination in. Here's a visual rendering of it, 16th century era by Peter Bruegel the Elder. And you can see that, that Bruegel has identified what he would view as the sin of Babel, that you've got 
people and their power and their demanding authority, the pride of them putting down the people around them, kind of a sense of the aristocracy pushing down the lower classes. And I would say here, as far as his rendering of the Tower of Babel, something that I do find helpful is that you get the sense of all of humanity coming together for a single cause. I don't think that we're supposed to imagine just a pile of stones somewhere. But you're looking at people with long lifespans and lots of effort that comes together for one cause, they're going to accomplish a lot. But what exactly is the sin of Babel? What, what's going on here? There is, of course, other significance, apologetic significance, for explaining the existence of all of the different languages of the world, more significantly, why the world has diversified or broken up into all of the different regions all across the planet. The key to it is to recognize a specific command that God gave to humanity at the very beginning. At the beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, his command was to multiply and to fill the earth, to subdue it and have dominion all across the planet. Well, what that involved then is, of course, scattering or spreading abroad across the planet. And if now we compare that to specifically the account of Babel in Genesis 11, notice this pattern with the word scatter. Their concern is, let us build a city and a tower, let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Their concern is that they would be spread apart. God's answer to that is that he does, by mixing up their languages, scatters them abroad upon the face of all the earth. The Lord did scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And three different times we've got that emphasis enough so that I, I think with safety we can say the real focus of the Babel account is that people are refusing to fulfill God's intention for humanity, fill the earth, and instead they're gathered together in one place for uniting in one cause that's contravening his purposes. Now, there are other things that we could talk about in this respect. We could notice, for instance, their specific language, let us make a name. And their goal to reach unto heaven, probably some kind of sense here of self-divination, that we would achieve the original sin that, that condemned the human race in the beginning, that we would be like gods. So there's a sense of being remembered and pride and arrogance. But I think the core of it then, putting all of that together, is also humanity's determination to resist God and his purposes for them. Of course, God's work in them, spreading them out, ironically, ends up returning them back to the purpose they were supposed to have. They do scatter out because they have to. And I would view then the judgment of Babel as absolutely, yes, a judgment, but as God always does, it's judgment mixed together with mercy. He is delivering humanity from the fate that they would bring themselves to, the thing they choose for themselves. He's giving them something better. He's giving them what they ought to do. He's actually kind of forcing humanity to do what it ought to do in spite of itself. If we stretch the time scale out distantly into the future, we discover two other echoes in the distant future. And one is that God is going to kind of turn this backwards at a future time for the sake of the gospel. So the same God who has the power to scramble the languages in order to force people to spread out upon the earth is the God who at Pentecost is able to bring about a miracle and give some people the power to speak in many languages so that the gospel can spread across the world. And that's pointing to a vision that extends through the Great Commission and even through missions today. While people don't have the miraculous gift of tongues, as we go around the world and we call people to come under the reign of Jesus Christ, we are calling them to recognize a single king, all of the world under his headship. Now, the other distant and future echo is that when Satan rebels against God, the form this will take is a one-world government under Satan's headship. So the desire of humanity to be one and to join for a single cause altogether is actually accomplished temporarily, in a way, eventually under Satan's headship. And we can see the results. It's terrible. It's horrifying. The corruption goes deep. 
But I do believe that the Revelation one world government is in some way an echo, Babel in Genesis 11 to Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. And we see parallels across the two. But we can recognize finally that when the earth is right and as it ought to be, humanity will come together in, in submission under one king, Jesus Christ. In other words, I think part of the irony of Babel is that people are trying to accomplish something that would be good if it was under God's headship. They just do it for themselves, for their own honor. Let us make a name for ourselves and in refusing God's purposes. One more echo in Genesis 11 is going to take us to the next passage that we'll consider. Notice that part of their concern is to make a name for themselves, to bring themselves honor. And something that's interesting when we move to the next stage of the Genesis history is that one of God's promises is that he will make a name, a name not for rebellious humans, but for those who willingly accept his reign. So that moves us to the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I should say first, in respect to the Abrahamic promises, that we can find this as a, as a pattern that stretches all across this section. Multiple times, God speaks to Abraham and offers him these blessings. The climactic event, however, is Genesis 22, 16 to 18, a passage that we've already looked at multiple times. And it's the promise from God to Abraham that he will bless Abraham. He will multiply Abraham's seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore. That's an echo of the Genesis command to be fruitful and multiply. And then a contrast to Babel, people that refuse to spread out and fill the earth. But Abraham, Abraham and his offspring will multiply and fill the earth. Your siege will possess the gate of his enemies. I think that's probably an echo of Genesis 3.15, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. An international, universal, everything kind of view for the blessing that God intends. Let's pause for a, prom for a moment and, and just see what are the promises described by the Abrahamic covenant and how does, how does God describe these blessings to us? We can speak of three main promises given to Abraham. First, the promise of many descendants. We just saw that in chapter 22. Your descendants will be like the stars of heaven. Second, the promise of a land. And if you're recognizing Abraham as a nomad traveling about in the desert, and there's nowhere where he actually settles as a place to live. The nations of the world are spread out, many of them in their own place, but where will Abraham go? And later, his descendants, as they become many and they're in Egypt, they have no land of their own. So the promise of this is that eventually there will be a place that they can call theirs. It will belong to them. And thirdly, the promise is the promise of a universal blessing. Again, we saw that your seed or in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The entire world will appreciate and know the blessings that come from Abraham's faith. What then was Abraham's response of faith? Because this is a very important pattern that we find across the New Testament and Old Testament, an emphasis on Abraham as the original believer, Abraham as the one who is the father of faith or who shows us the pattern of what faith looks like. And this is related to a different kind of question. And the question goes, how was Abraham saved or at least how much did he know? In other words, the New Testament is very explicit that Abraham was saved by faith. This is Romans 3, this is Galatians, or Romans 4 and Galatians 3 to 4. Very evident and clear that it is salvation by faith and that Christ is part of the content of that faith. John 8, 56, Jesus Christ himself speaking and his words are, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Abraham recognized the coming Messiah and placed his faith in that coming Messiah. And similar to that, the emphasis of Romans and Galatians, the very strong emphasis that Abraham is the original believer that shows us the picture of faith. So what does this mean? Or in what way then was Abraham the father of faith? 
Well, a couple of things that support this. Um, we find indications of the, the idea that the Old Testament absolutely points to Jesus Christ. All across the New Testament, major statements that the prophets, the writings, the scriptures, all of them point to Christ. And so we could expect that much. We're just not quite sure of how to say that Abraham had faith in Christ. What could he know about Christ? I, certainly, he couldn't know the name Jesus. So what would it mean to believe in Christ or believe in the coming Messiah? There are certain hints that are striking and interesting. For instance, we can recognize that there could have been special revelation. We've got some insights where in certain places, for instance, Melchizedek, you have a king of a righteous city and, and that city then reigning as a priest and a king. Somehow he's a believer in the Most High God. We don't know how he knew that. We don't know where that came from. We don't know any of the story, but somehow he knew. Is God revealing information to people that maybe is not recorded in scripture? There's no reason to say otherwise or to assume that that can't be. But even if all we have is just the Old Testament record itself, there are some strong indications of the gospel and what could have been known already about the coming Messiah. Just consider these possible points. Remember, as we've already talked about several times, the seed promise of Genesis 3.15. If you're doing the chronology and you're working through the generations, it's not that many generations between Adam and Abraham. And these truths pass down generation to generation to generation. It's even plausible that Abraham and Noah's lives were very close to each other in terms of time. So what could Abraham know? Well, we would expect, actually, that the tradition or the memory of the Genesis 3.15 promise would be carried down. When will the seed come? There are sacrifices as early as Cain and Abel. And as we proceed through the story, we see Noah also offering sacrifices. Abraham is also offering sacrifices. Why sacrifices? What does that mean? Where did they learn to do sacrifices? We don't know. The scripture never tells us, but apparently they did have some kind of revelation guiding them in this way. And we know that sacrifices point to the reality of a future intercessor, one who dies on our behalf. In fact, the story gets richer and more beautiful still, because in the case of Isaac in Genesis 22, we actually find a person is the sacrifice. Now, you know the story, Abraham never actually offered Isaac, but he was prepared to do so. And it was said to him then that on the Mount of the Lord, this will be provided, that, that somehow something's happening here that points far into the future. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham processed this in terms of the possibility of resurrection. So all of that to link into some kind of understanding, a sacrifice will be made, a person, possibly as that sacrifice. Now, remember too, that the Abrahamic promises talk a lot about the seed. Over and over again, we receive the statement that Abraham will receive offspring, that offspring will be the answer. And if Abraham knows the Genesis 3.15 promise of the seed, and that links into what he's now hearing about the seed, then you're not shocked to conclude that Abraham also is putting his trust in that seed, the seed that will bring hope for the world in fulfillment of the Genesis promise. And finally, I'd like to highlight that Abraham theologized from what he knew, meaning Abraham saw what was going on and he reasoned from it. The first example is what's here. Abraham believed that God would preserve Isaac's life. And what I mean by that is if you think back to the Genesis 22 incident, Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham has faith that God will provide a way. But think about what Abraham knew. God had told him that through Isaac, he would be made a great nation, that Isaac would have offspring, and that Isaac's offspring would be the beginning of a nation that would be a blessing to the world and ultimately the seed that will be the blessing to the world. Abraham knows that Isaac is a young man. He has not yet had children. 
and therefore the seed promise is not yet fulfilled. Notice Abraham's word, words, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And so they go forward in faith. And Hebrews 11, theologizing on that, says that Abraham accounted that God was able to raise up Isaac even from the dead. So apparently Abraham's reasoning was something like, I know that God has promised through Isaac will be my seed. And I know that Isaac has, as of yet, no children. And what that means then is I'm still waiting, but I know that Isaac cannot, will not stay dead because God must fulfill his word. Another layer that functions like this, a pattern of reasoning, Genesis 24. This is when Abraham is talking to his servant about bringing a daughter or bringing a wife for Isaac. And so the question is, will he go and find a woman who will be willing to marry Isaac? How will this be done? And Abraham cites in verse 7, The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house, and who swore unto me, saying, Unto thy seed, your offspring, I will give this land. He shall send his angel before you. You will take a wife for my son from there. Why and how is Abraham reasoning? Again, Abraham's reasoning is, well, God has promised that there will be descendants, many, and ultimately a descendant, a single one, that will be the answer for the problems of the world. And those descendants will come through Isaac. He specifically knows this. And therefore, Abraham, looking at the entire situation and recognizing that there is no woman, there is no one to be with Isaac in order for Isaac to multiply, for there to be many descendants, then God has not yet fulfilled his word, but God will do this. The story's not over yet. I think that's really helpful for the way we process systematic theology and for the way we reason from Scripture. When God has spoken and given a promise, then we know that he will fulfill his word, and that extends even to the implications, things that we don't understand and things that we do not yet see. We're waiting for him to fulfill his word, and he ultimately will fulfill it. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that this leaves a lot of questions. If the blessing will come, a descendant of Abraham, who is that blessing? Is it Isaac? Or is somehow another future descendant of Isaac the blessing? Or is Israel, the entire nation, the blessing? Where will this blessing come from? And part of what's going on as you trace out the rest of the book of Genesis is that you're watching Isaac and Isaac's failing in different ways. Isaac sins and ultimately Isaac dies. Isaac's descendant, Jacob, now is not perfect. In fact, quite tainted. And Judah, and all the way through, as you're seeing the different individuals, everyone one of them is broken in their own way. You might come to the end of the book of Genesis and think that perhaps Joseph is the answer. Is he the seed? Is he the one who will finally break the curse? And the book of Genesis ends with Joseph dying. So, so far, we keep on proceeding through the story with faith that God will eventually bring about the blessing and that blessing will come through the seed. We're just not sure who and how or what. All we can say at this point is that Abraham can know and place his faith in the promises of God. And to summarize what Abraham put his faith in, or to um, summarize the content of Abraham's faith, I, I think we could state it like this. Whatever the other details, Abraham could at least know that an actual descendant of humans, an actual descendant of his, would reverse the curse by providing a final sacrifice and becoming a blessing for the world. And, and if you look at that statement, I think that's sufficient to say, I'm seeing in that the gospel. It's not the name of Jesus Christ. There's no reference to the cross and details like that. All of these are truths that we're going to learn much further in the story as we come to understand what the gospel unfolds in the New Testament. But this content, points to the core and basic realities that Abraham must place his faith in to believe in Jesus Christ, the salvation of the world. That leads me, as our last discussion, to talk about a theology of the seed. 
And what I've discussed here so far and repeatedly is just the pattern of this offspring language or this seed language. But we have to go beyond that to recognize how often and how significantly this concept recurs that we're seeing this as a major theological idea. So starting with the Old Testament, let's just see how often this offspring happens. The offspring language in Genesis 3.15, Eve's hope that there is another offspring and she's having children. The offspring in the promises to Noah and the reality that there will be future for humanity. Then the promises to Abraham, your offspring, your offspring, your offspring, and your offspring will be blessed and fill the earth. Even hints of Egypt and the bondage, but the promise recurring again, your offspring will be multiplied and they will be many. Okay, many, many passages and a massive theme spreading throughout the Old Testament, the promise of the offspring. If we keep on moving forward into the Old Testament, then we come to important passages talking about David's offspring. The hope and the promise that there will be a future descendant that will rule and reign forever. And that descendant connected to David actually draws from previous roots. The story of Ruth to understand the richness of that book is telling us the story of how God provided for that offspring in David's ancestors. And when that comes to its full flowering in the Davidic covenant, this offspring as king is the hope for the nation of Israel, but the hope for the world, a king who will reign over all things. The progression becomes even more dramatic when we get to Isaiah. And we see the pattern that there is a, a seed, Israel, that has failed. They have become a wicked seed in many passages across Isaiah. And, and so if the promise of blessing for the world is involved with the seed, we're not sure anymore if Israel is going to fulfill that hope. After all, Israel is tainted and wicked. Yet the promise remains, we discover. So who is that hope? Isaiah tells us that there's a righteous seed, one who will be born to Israel, who is the mighty God, the everlasting father, Isaiah 9, 6, who will reign over Israel righteously. And in fact, to expand that promise even further, Isaiah talks about another blessed seed, the many, those who are the descendants of this Messiah or the children of this Messiah, believers. And finally, the Old Testament ends with a hope of Micah 5, 2, that one will be born who will be ruler. He has been eternal. He has existed forever, but he will be born, a descendant of humans who will reign. Pause for a moment and just put these pieces together. I have multiple connections then from across the Old Testament, major emphases on the promise of the seed. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman. Genesis 22, the seed of Abraham. The seed of David in Psalm 89 and in the Davidic covenant passages. Jeremiah 31, even again, the promise of the righteous seed. And that helps us appreciate what's going on in all of the genealogies. As you go across Genesis 5, Genesis 11, 1 Chronicles, Ruth, Luke, Matthew, these extended genealogies are they're kind of hard reading. And we might come to those and, and, if we admit it to ourselves, find ourselves feeling a little bored by all of the detail. If we understand these richly, though, the pattern of these passages is to say, take heart, there is a righteous seed coming, and he will redeem Israel from all of its sin. Do you remember the way I displayed some of the information earlier with the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent? We talked about the pattern that most of humanity is in the category of the wicked, the seed of the serpent, or at least acting like the serpent. And that it's only occasionally that we have a few exceptions, what I gave a purple line to, certain people that seem to show something different. Noah, Abraham, Seth. But the real picture of this goes that we're starting with, truthfully, a new beginning. And in place of Adam and Eve, we're talking about the Messiah, who is the ultimate seed, the offspring. 
He comes fully human. He takes human flesh. And the result of that then is that he has many children. And the structure of his line is not as with Adam and Eve, where we have many coming from many. The structure of his line is much simpler. Each one of those who put their faith in him are the children of God. They have direct relationship with him. And so he brings blessing to the many. This is why we read language like Adam, the first Adam, Jesus, the second Adam. And what we're looking at and the longing of the ages is not just for someone to transform humanity a little bit, kind of solve our problems, tidy things up a bit, make things a little more tolerable. What we're looking for, what we desperately need, is a complete transformation. We need a new humanity. We need a second Adam to fulfill everything that Adam failed to be. And if you recall also Noah and how he then at that point appears to possibly be our hope. And the answer is no, Noah actually brings about a curse. If you want to know who brings a true real beginning to it all, that is no, none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the second Adam that brings us hope. Do you remember the Matthew 1 genealogy, son of Abraham, son of David? and the hope that it gives in that genealogy, and the conclusion of the genealogy, that he comes to save his people from their sins. Only Jesus Christ can accomplish that. Or go to the preaching of Acts, Acts chapter 3, and the promise or the reminder that the Old Testament has anticipated this, that the Christ would certainly suffer, that he would bring about times of refreshing, that the Christ would be appointed for you, Jesus, and that this Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises that God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Jesus is that blessing. Jesus is the seed, the offspring, the hope of humanity. If we keep on going in the rest of the New Testament, Paul's argument extends this in Galatians 3. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, his seed, his descendant. It does not say, and to offsprings as of many, but it speaks of one, your offspring, who is Christ. And so Jesus Christ came born of a woman, fully human, fully God, to bring hope to humanity so that the offspring of the serpent would be redeemed. One other passage appears in Revelation 12, and it's a very striking symbolic passage. A woman clothed with the sun is pregnant. She's crying out in birth, in agony. And then eventually when she gives birth, she gave birth to a male child who to, is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. He's caught up to God into his throne and he's victorious. And the rest, result of this is that the dragon is angry. The dragon sought to stand before the woman to give birth because he wanted to devour her child. And that as then a theological grid for the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament helps us see this picture now in its fullness. That from the beginning of time, Satan was trying to destroy the seed of the woman. From the beginning of time, you see the struggle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. You see this in moments like Pharaoh with the children of Israel. You see it in Herod trying to kill all of the children at the birth of Jesus Christ. And you see it all the way to the end. Satan has been trying to destroy God and his purposes and the promises of the seed. But beautifully, as we know, and as was prophesied, prophesied from Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman prevails. The offspring of the woman and the hope of humanity, Jesus Christ, crushes the head of the serpent and restores to us life. In conclusion, an encouragement for all of us. And the result of sin and what ought to happen is quite transparent. What we deserve is simply judgment, just judgment. In its place, God has given us more than just restored relationship. He did not merely and only take away the judgment that would have rightfully been ours. That would have been mercy enough. But he went far beyond, and he entered into our humanity. He took flesh 
Jesus Christ became human. He became, remember, an offspring of the woman, an offspring of Abraham and David. He became truly human to restore humanity from ourselves and taking flesh as one of us then. He becomes the second Adam. He fulfills everything that Adam should have been and done. And he allows then for us as his descendants, not merely to be in some kind of association with God, as though, well, we can partially restore the relationship and make things okay enough. But he instead offers us to be his children, the children of God and to enter into relationship with God far beyond what we could have ever imagined or hoped for. This is the promise and the beauty of the seed, the offspring of the woman, entering into humanity to redeem humanity so that we can enjoy fellowship with God. And the roots of this beautiful promise extend all the way back to the beginning. The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 3.15, the promises of a seed, who would be a blessing to the world. If you know him, you have come to know that blessing. You now, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, have relationship with Abraham's offspring, the offspring of the woman who crushes the head of the serpent and bring, brings hope to the world.